Um, this is a really old project that I'm, I'm dusting off. Uh, so David Lewis, I sadly never got to, to meet, but he had a big impact on my philosophical development, and I spent a lot of my uh, doctoral uh, work struggling to uh, kind of make sense of some of the, the darker recesses of the Lewisian uh, system, especially uh, with respect to modality. Uh, so my PhD project was a, like, a version of modal realism that draws on physics. I'm not going to talk about that today. But uh, when comparing that project that I was developing with Lewisian modal realism, which is kind of the obvious forerunner of it, um, I, I, kept, I could understand most of what was going on in modal realism really clearly. Lewis is ordinarily extraordinarily clear. This discussion uh, in, on the plurality of worlds of plenitude was a peculiar exception. And I've spent uh, probably 15 years now struggling to work out what Lewis meant by plenitude and what recombination has to do with the criterion of plenitude. Uh, so uh, I'm revisiting this stuff now with a bit of trepidation because it's been been a while since uh, I thought about this. So my mind may, may have changed. I might find my mind have changed by the end of this presentation. So what, what is plenitude? Uh, it's meant to be a part of the theory of modal realism. Modal realism being the view that uh, modality is a matter of what goes on at uh, the whole range of genuine, the, uh, genuine possible worlds that are concrete, they exist, they're just like this one. So if you're giving a modal realist theory, you need to say at least a little bit about what the space of possible worlds is like. You can say that ours is one, and you say there are some more like this, but how many more? Uh, how much like this one? So which ones are there? And Lewis tells us in On the Plurality of Worlds that he initially thought he could just make these stipulations one and two on the handout, that every way that a world could possibly be is a way that some world is, every way that some part of a world could possibly be is a way that some part of some world is. He then recounts that Van Inwagen points out to him what should have been kind of obvious, that those are uh, trivial consequences of the modal realist analysis of modality. Given what modal realists say modality is, those consequences just fall out straight away. And uh, they would be true if there was exactly one world, this one, and that was the only possibility there was. That presumably isn't plenitudinous enough. So, Lewis says we should let those conditions be trivially satisfied, that they fall out of the analysis. And now we need, he says, uh, a new way to say what one and two seem to say, that there are possibilities enough and no gaps in logical space. So what, what does that mean? This, this talk is basically trying to work out what that means. Uh, so just a paraphrase of that is what I have here, diversity. Modal realism, like an adequate modal realist theory, should entail that the possible worlds there are manifest sufficient qualitative diversity. So still is designed to leave questions unanswered. Uh, in what respects uh, do we need diversity? And what counts as sufficient diversity in those respects? And then the really peculiar puzzling thing about this passage is that it kind of takes a, uh, a sharp uh, turn off sideways and goes into a discussion of recombination without really having told us what plenitude amounts to now, it doesn't amount to this trivial thing, Lewis says that um, he's going to address the question of plenitude using this principle of recombination. He doesn't give a formal statement of the principle of recombination, I guess deliberately, in On the Plurality of Worlds, but there's a, a statement on the handout that I'm not going to read out. Uh, but he says that uh, this principle of recombination is capable of expressing or capturing plenitude. So it's definitely got something to do with the condition of plenitude. And the kind of main clue that we have, I think, from the text in on, plurality of the on the plurality of worlds is that plenitude has to be the kind of condition that recombination is relevant to, that recombination goes at least some way towards meeting, because he clearly did think it went at least some way towards meeting it. So the simplest way to, to, uh, to handle that would just be to say that the principle of plenitude is, a, is the requirement that recombination should be true in a modal realist theory. It just is the requirement of recombination. Uh, but Lewis denies that. He says that recombination <coughs> is not by itself enough to get plenitude. And there's this passage from page 92 at the end of section one on the handout. Uh, he's saying that because there are alien possibilities, possibilities 
in which there are properties instantiated that aren't instantiated at the actual world, we can't get uh, the full plenitude of possibilities just by rearranging non-alien ones. So the principle of recombination falls short of capturing all the plenitude of possibilities. And there are various things to ask about why that is. But um, I'm going to take that to be motivation to go looking for some other criterion of plenitude. And at this point, uh, I'm going to bring up this discussion by John Divers and Joseph Melia uh, in their paper, The Analytic Limit of Genuine Modal Realism, which also diverted me for a very long time uh, during my PhD project. Uh, it took me far too long to, to figure out what was going on um, in that paper. And because this is, was originally like an hour-long talk and I'm trying to give it in 20 minutes, uh, I'm not going to go into the back and forth with, with Divers and Melia or kind of pick apart their paper to kind of back up the claim that they're making the argument I'm going to attribute to them here. But they want to argue that there's something wrong with modal realism, that it can't be reductive, because it can't uh, satisfy this condition that they call accuracy, and which they link to plenitude. So they have this condition they call accuracy. It has these one and two uh, components. Uh, top of section two of the handout. Uh, and they say that the ontological component, that is the kind of principles that specify the ontology of Lewisian modal realism, or, uh, should generate a set of worlds that determine the truth values of the exist existential claims about worlds that figure in the modal realist analysis of modality. So there's going to be some claims about what worlds there are, and then what's possible is going to be explained in terms of what worlds there are. Uh, and the theory should generate, they say, uh, a set of worlds that fixes the truth value of all those existential claims. And then they make a claim about our prior modal beliefs. They say the truth values that the theory gives for those existential claims about the, the, you know, what the theory says about which worlds there are should match by and large the truth values that we would assign on the basis of our prior modal beliefs. There's, going to be, there's got to be a by and large match with our prior beliefs. And that sounds quite a Lewisian thing to say. But I'm going to argue that it's actually, especially the first part of that requirement, is not at all a Lewisian sort of requirement. Uh, so rather than taking it apart in detail, I'm just going to give you these two versions, which I think is the, the first principle exhaustive plenitude is the stronger one conservative plenitude being the weaker one. So exhaustive plenitude says that uh, modal realism has to kind of uniquely fix a set of worlds. M modal realism has to entail um, kind of for every candidate world whether there is that world or not. So it has to, uh, it has to fix the exact extension of modal reality. That's what a modal realist theory should do. And a modal realist theory that doesn't tell us exactly what modal reality contains is a bad modal realist theory that can't be reductive. And I interpret them as uh, applying that strict condition in, the, in their argument, but I think it's just an unreasonable condition. There's a weaker condition in the vicinity I call conservative plenitude, which is that not that modal realism has to fix the extension of modal reality completely. It just has to entail enough about modal reality. It has to entail enough about the space of possibilities uh, that possibility claims where we have strong opinions are captured. So if we're like really sure that there could have been a talking donkey, then there had better be a world with a talking donkey in it, and so on for all the other things we're really sure are possible. But where our pre-theoretic model opinion doesn't deliver a strong verdict, especially in the context of specific alien properties that aren't actually instantiated, where pre-theoretic opinion couldn't deliver a verdict because we can't even refer to those properties, in those cases, modal realism doesn't have to determine whether those worlds are in or out. It couldn't even do so if it wanted to. Uh, 
And so my, my line, and I'm not going to defend it properly, that um, there's, a, there's a full written version of this paper. It's 10,000 words long, so it could email me for it if you dare. But uh, the conclusion of this section is just that uh, conservative plenitude is at least a prima facie reasonable condition, but it doesn't have the bad consequences that Divers Amelia uh, uh, draw. And those bad consequences will only be supported by this exhaustive plenitude condition, which is way too strong. So we're on section three now, and I'm going to go over this very quickly because hopefully you will want to agree that exhaustive plenitude is much too strong a condition. Uh, it, broadly speaking, what's wrong with exhaustive plenitude is it... Uh, mixes up the requirement for us to say what modality is, what, what it is to be possible, with the requirement that we say which things are possible. And you can say what it is to be possible without saying everything about which things are possible. And what it is to be reductive is to say what it is to be possible without presupposing any modal notions. Uh, you don't need, in order to be reductive, also to entail every possible detail about the extension of modal space. And there's a couple of comparisons. Uh, so Ross Cameron has also drawn some comparisons like this in a, a recent paper, which I'm afraid I haven't got on the handout. So that was stuff that kind of uh, he wrote after this, this, this paper was written, but it's just been sitting on my, my hard drive for 10 years, unfortunately. Um, so in mass, uh, we want to say kind of what it is for some mathematical entity to exist, what it is for some mathematical statement to be true, that's the kind of thing that mathematical Platonism uh, uh, and various forms of, of nominalism, they try to do. Um, but those theories of the metaphysics of maths don't have to settle every mathematical question. That's the job for mathematicians, not philosophers of maths. Same for mind. Uh, if you're giving a philosophical theory of the mind, you need to say what it is for something to be a mental state and what it is maybe for those mental states to be conscious or a perceptual state or, or something like that. You don't need to tell us which mental states there are. Uh, the kind of exploration of the variety of mental states in the world is a job for psychologists, not for philosophers of mind. And it's kind of peculiar uh, why I think, in, kind of in retrospect to me, it's peculiar why Divers and Melia found this sort of condition uh, plausible in the first place, the requirement that modal realism should entail all uh, should kind of completely fix the extension of modal space, thereby entail all of the truth values of all uh, modal statements. So set aside exhaustive plenitude, it's much too strong. Uh, conservative plenitude says that where we have strong views about modal reality, uh, modal realism should by and large vindicate those views. And that seems a kind of reasonable constraint. I think Lewis did think that was a reasonable constraint. But I don't think that's enough to uh, capture plenitude by itself, or at least a bit more needs to be said. And I'm just appealing here to this passage from page 87 of Plurality um, in section 4 of the handout. Uh, and he says, you can get a principle of plenitude that says all of our um, modal beliefs need to be recovered. But that would be a bad principle. It's not, it's not the principle we're looking for. Um, it indiscriminately endorses offhand opinion. I don't know why I cut, cut it off there. Shame. So the thought is that if we want to get the, kind of the right principle of plenitude that really captures the substantive theoretical requirement in the vicinity, we need to be more discriminating about which possibilities plenitude should include and less offhand about it. So we need to look somewhere for some guidance that isn't just pre-theoretic modal opinion. We need in some way to refine or to nuance uh, pre-theoretic modal opinion to get an, an acceptable principle of plenitude. So in section five, that's what I'm going to tr try to do. And what I'm going to use is the notion of a Lewisian law, the kind of thing that comes up in his account of laws of nature when he's giving what has become known as the best system of analysis associated with Lewis, also with Mill, Ramsey, and others. So a step back for a second. 
Lewis's methodology is naturalistic in the sense that it doesn't, it, 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 it's naturalistic in the Quinean sense that it sees the project of inquiry of metaphysics and science as broadly continuous with one another. There isn't a very sharp di division between a question that is a, you have a spectrum rather than a sharp divide between uh, metaphysical questions and scientific questions. Broadly speaking, they're both investigating the way that the world is. Metaphysics is just investigating the more general ways and science is generating, is investigating the more specific ways. And that fits with a lot of what he says in the plurality of worlds about the methodology, the inference of the best explanation that is, the grand inference of the best explanation that is at the heart of the argument for modal realism is meant to be the kind of methodology that scientists use. And so we're applying that general abductive methodology in metaphysics and that's a good thing to do. But Lewis is a bit more specific about the methodology that scientists use when he's talking about laws of nature because he wants his criteria for what makes a generalization into a law to track what scientists actually say about laws of nature. So his account of laws is, I've got it here, is roughly those true universal generalizations about some individual world like ours, which collectively strike the best balance between simplicity and strength, and maybe probabilistic fit, but leave that aside. So here, these conditions of the best balance between simpli simplicity and strength are meant to be, that's what scientists do when they're trying to come up with theories. They want to come up with theories which are simple but also say a lot, and sometimes you might need to make trade-offs, but overall you want to say true stuff um, as much as you can, as simply as possible, and then science is the art of making those trade-offs with respect to the uh, empirical data, or your scientific theory building is that, that art. And if that's meant to be standard scientific methodology and the methodology of science and metaphysics is meant to be continuous, it seems to make sense that we can apply the method, that methodology looking for the best balance between strength and simplicity to the whole of what we take to exist. I mean, why restrict ourselves to applying the methodology just to the actual world? Why not apply it to everything? So if we do apply it to everything, what do we get? Lewis thought that there were many worlds uh, that differed in many ways, but one thing he thought he knew about them was that the principle of recombination held. And that looks at an ideal candidate for a Lewisian law, so-called law of the plurality, as I'm calling them. So if you apply the best system approach to the whole plurality of worlds, it looks like the principle of recombination is going to, is going to be such a good candidate to be included in the best system that it will be in any plausible best system. Maybe plus some other stuff about how many alien properties there are. So that suggests that we can uh, explicate the plenitude requirement in terms of uh, laws of the plurality. The reason the principle of recombination is helping us to answer the plenitude requirement is because it's a really good candidate for a law of the plurality. And the plenitude requirement is that you should have a plausible set of these laws uh, as part of your modal realist theory. And crucially, the lack of arbitrariness uh, that Lewis seemed to want to impose with plenitude as a criterion, there shouldn't be just 17 worlds, that would be unacceptably arbitrary, he says elsewhere. Uh, that lack of arbitrariness is already built in now via the concept of a law, which is... Um, to be a law is to be a kind of non-arbitrary uh, true universal generalization um, on, on, on this picture. It kind of falls out of the, the balancing of strengths and simplicity. And then the question is, what, what is it to include a plausible set of such laws? I think I want to be kind of fairly minimalist here and just say a plausible set of laws is one where you can't reasonably accuse somebody that puts forward a, a plurality of worlds like that uh, of changing the subject. As long as you're kind of clearly still talking about modality when you put forward a plurality like, the, like this, that's an acceptable candidate set of laws of the plurality. And then we kind of compare them because it's not obvious that modal realism is exactly the right way, Lewisian modal realism is exactly the right way to do modal realism. There could be other better modal realist theories around the corner. Um, but the plenitude requirement is that they should also should have a 
candidate set of laws of the plurality. And my kind of quantum version of modal realism has a different set of laws of the plurality. The Schrodinger equation is, is one of them, but that's another story. So I'm probably out of time, but um, I'll just finish by posing a question. As far as I know, Lewis never did extend the best system anal analysis beyond the actual world. He never used it to kind of systematize the kind of claims about the plurality of worlds. He never used it in uh, maths or metaphysics either. He didn't try to give like a best system of the myriological facts or, or of the mathematical facts. So why not? Some candidate answers could be that this best system analysis is only good for contingent matters, or that it's only good for concrete matters, or it's only good for causal matters. Um, but why would those restrictions be well motivated? I'm not seeing what in Lewis's overall methodology is stopping him applying the best system analysis more widely than just to the contingent contents of the actual world. Thanks. Thank you.